All right, every, a very good morning to all. I am Hezri Musa, one of the trade manager at BIA Executive Office. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well. Welcome to BMCC's sixth webinar, which is part of a series of webinars on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and MCO to businesses, especially to our members. The topics for this webinar are based on the responses that we received uh, from the recent survey we conducted on the implication of COVID-19 to businesses. Uh, these are the topics that the respondents say they needed most advice on. So for today's webinar, we are very pleased to collaborate with Herbert Smith Freehills on the topic entitled Managing Contractual Obligations. So dear viewers, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused every business, both big and small, to critically assess the impact to their operations, people as well as governance. One of the key challenges faced by companies with the further extended movement control order, which was announced its extension last week by the Prime Minister of Malaysia, is meeting contractual obligations and understanding the legal implications. So today, our two special guests, whom both have vast experience in major projects, will shed lights on the practical challenges faced by businesses resulting from COVID-19 and how companies can cope with this crisis more effectively from a legal standpoint. Joining us today, our first speaker, he is a dispute resolution specialist, Peter Godwin, partner head of disputes Asia at Herbert Smith Freehills. Our second speaker, he is a transactional specialist, Glenn Cooper, partner at Herbert Smith Freehills. Before I pass the session over to the speakers, just a quick note for all our viewers. If you do have any questions to ask during session, please submit yours via the Q&A function tab available. The speakers will choose the questions to answer during the Q&A session after the presentations. So without further ado, I would pass the session to Peter Godwin. Peter? Thank you very much, Hezri, and good morning, everybody. Um, we live in a strange world. Um, it would be very easy to sit here and convince ourselves that doomsday is just around the corner. And I think we need, all need to be careful that that doesn't become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, our, our role is to try and keep you optimistic, yet realistic, and help you through some of the challenges that you'll doubtless be facing. Before we get into the two main themes um, that we're gonna to talk to you about this morning, um, we thought we'd just run through a few of the things that we are seeing generally, just to give you a, a sense of what's out there. And if you do have questions, um, then obviously we would be more than happy to um, deal with those. But what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing lots of force majeure notices, and we will talk about that. And that's what I'll be talking to you about in a moment. So enough on that for the moment. And then we're, we're seeing a lot of practical challenges with getting deals done. Simple things like how do you sign a document when you're sitting at home in your living room rather than in your office? Um, and that is surprisingly complicated and varies across the region and across the globe. And Glyn will talk to you about that at some length. But what else are we seeing? Well, no surprise, we're seeing heaps and heaps of employment issues. Um, there's various government support systems in place for different types of employee in different sectors. There's furloughing schemes around the world. There's huge questions around, can you require people to take leave, whether paid or unpaid? Um, on a similar note, can you in, impose pay cuts on people is a common question in this environment. Um, and the worst case scenario, can you make people redundant as a result of the impact that COVID is having on your business? So huge amounts of employment advice being given. Similarly, lots of people thinking about restructuring. That might be informal processes, just how do we raise more money? How do we restructure the loans that we've got through to more, more formal process involving voluntary arrangements, um, sanctioned by the court, or in the worst case, um, insolvencies and winding up strategies. Um, no surprise that that's on everybody's lips at the moment. Uh, we would undoubtedly see more and more of that sort of advice, not just in Malaysia, but around the world. Um, what else are we seeing? Well, we're seeing distressed investments being bought and sold. Um, it is fair to say some people have already got their shopping baskets out. Uh, there are some cheap assets to be bought if you're really brave and you happen to have the cash. Um, the, the vulture funds or the private debt funds as they're more politely called 
uh, are looking for those opportunities. They think there's money to be made in the medium term. Again, you see that after every crisis. We saw it after the GFC back in 2008. We saw it after SARS. Um, so no surprise, but uh, watch this space. The Chinese have got the shopping bags out. The Japanese are in Golden Week holiday this week, but you can pretty much guarantee they'll have their shopping baskets nicely polished by the end of the, the holiday week. Uh, and the Koreans as well are beginning to show their, uh, their muscle in financial terms. What else are we seeing? Well, obviously lots of regulatory advice. In Malaysia, we've got the MCO. What does that mean for different companies, different sectors? Um, are you a, a, a required industry or not? Um, if you are, what does it mean you can do? What can't you do? Lots of advice around that. We've seen lots of changes in insolvency, insolvency regimes around the, um, the region, uh, Singapore, Australia, most recently here in Malaysia itself. Again, no huge surprise that people are, are looking at ways to help companies, small and large, uh, through these difficult times. Uh, we saw the government here impose moratoriums on loan repayments. I'm told the banks got a massive two hours notice when that was introduced. Um, it cost them probably about three weeks of frantic effort to actually work out how to implement it. So lots of exciting things for them to be doing. There's other smaller issues around sort of filing dates for statutory accounts, for having AGMs, these sorts of things. Things we take for granted in an ordinary world have suddenly become problematic. And then, of course, there's various stimulus message measures around the world. Uh, they're coming out on, well, we're coming out on an almost daily basis. They've slowed a bit, but we haven't seen the last of them. So what do they mean? In different sectors, we're seeing different things. In the real estate sector, if you're an investor in office and retail, you're probably pretty worried at the moment. Um, are we ever going to go back to having big offices in cent central parts of town? Or is home working here to stay and our real estate needs consequently smaller? Don't know the answer. I have my own view. Uh, time will tell. Meanwhile, if you're in logistics and data centers, business is booming. Everybody needs more of that sort of stuff. So uh, big opportunities in that space if you happen to be hanging on to assets. Meanwhile, the big infrastructure projects, no surprise, they've slowed down. Why? They need lots of cash. Cash is in short supply at the moment. So no surprises there. Yet the renewable sector in the energy world is remaining buoyant. Can't honestly explain it to you. Maybe it just means they're relatively small projects in the context of the size of an average energy project. So maybe people can afford them. Um, but we are seeing that particular sector remain very solid. Um, we're seeing lots of consolidation. And as I mentioned earlier, we are already seeing the re-emergence of certain Asian investors. And I mentioned the Chinese, the Japanese and the Koreans earlier. Um, they're here um, and they, they're not going to go away. So it's very interesting times. Um, as I say, it would be very easy to get too depressed. There's no point in doing that. One has to look forward and look for the opportunities and the opportunities abound. But maybe that's for a month or so's time, he says, hopefully. Uh, what's keeping people occupied at the moment? Well, well I'll be amazed if you're an in-house counsel sitting on that, this call, if you haven't either sent or received a notice of force majeure in the last six weeks, I'll be stunned. I had one client who, when this, the MCO was first introduced, was receiving three or more a day. Um, so what is force majeure? It's a strange old word, or two words, uh, and it's often very much misunderstood. So, and here I'm talking about common law jurisdictions. So Malaysia, England, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the like. In civil law jurisdictions, force majeure has some meaning as a matter of law, uh, and that's beyond the scope of today's talk. Today, we're just going to stick with what... Uh, most of us on this call understand, which is common law jurisdictions like Malaysia. Here, force majeure is meaningless unless your contract has something drafted into it that we would normally call a force majeure clause. Um, if it does, what that clause would normally say, it would say that in the event of a particular event occurring, you're relieved of liability of an obligation um, where you're prevented or delayed by the act of force majeure from performing. Um, you still have to try to perform and you have to mitigate any losses arising. But if you genuinely are prevented or delayed, then there will be some form of relief available to you. That sounds straightforward and everybody will be sitting there thinking, oh, pandemic. My force majeure clause talks about epidemics and pandemics. Therefore, big tick, I can rely on my force majeure clause. 
if only it were so simple. Is the law ever so simple? Of course it's not. People like you, me and Glyn would be out of a job if it was that easy. Uh, you have to ask yourself whether the pandemic has actually caused you to be prevented from or delayed in performing your contract. I would suggest to you that in most cases, the pandemic itself has not had that effect. You might find that surprising. But let's just think about it. Somebody get, getting ill, um, people around the world being ill, is that the cause of your problem? Almost certainly not. What is the cause of your problem are things like the MCO, where the government has ordered restrictions that have closed down factories and the like. That's what's caused the, the problem. So I, I suggest to you that most force, good, most valid force majeure clauses probably aren't relying on the pandemic. They're probably relying on things like governmental actions. Uh, and that, that's quite an interesting but important distinction. What does your contract then say, assuming you, you had the relevant force majeure clause? Well, it will require you to give notice um, to your counterparty explaining that you, you are in a position where you are prevented or delayed um, from performing. It will often require you to give evidence of that. It will often require you to update those notices every few weeks as things develop and change. Sometimes the giving of those notices are a condition precedent to you being able to rely on the clause at all. So if you haven't given your notice within the period specified in your contract, the first question is, oh, have I already given up my right to rely on this um, provision, which obviously would not be ideal. The other thing to be aware of is these clauses typically apply to some, but not all obligations in a contract. And perhaps the most common one that causes some surprise, but I think when you think about it is quite obvious, that it doesn't apply to is an obligation to make payment. Um, does a government action closing a factory prevent you from making a payment? Or well, no, it doesn't. If you've got your money in the bank account, uh, you can still make that payment. It might cause you to have less money in your bank account, but that's an insolvency issue. That is not an issue of force majeure. So you'll find that for banks where their um, contractual obligation, their loans, etc., are all about uh, the payment and receipt of money, force majeure is often quite irrelevant. Um, it, it's not a big part of their business. Whereas if you're a manufacturer and your factory is being closed down and your obligation is to deliver goods, then absolutely force majeure will be absolutely fundamental to what you're looking to do in the coming weeks and months. Um, so how do you rely on these force majeure clauses? And I've perhaps touched on this a little bit already, but most force majeure clauses will include epidemics or pandemics, but as I've mentioned earlier, they might not actually be the answer you're looking for. Uh, they may be, but they may not be. Far more likely in the current circumstances is you're looking for words like governmental action. Uh, there have been an awful lot of governmental actions over the last six weeks or so. Things like the MCO and their equivalent around the world. Um, so that, that's most likely what's going to be causing the trigger. You then need to just check quickly whether there's any mandatory local law that's relevant. As I say, in most common law jurisdictions, the answer to that will be no. But if you are are in a civil law jurisdiction and we have several in Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, Indonesia, it may be that there are um, provisions that aren't in your contract that you need to take account of that might either help you or hinder you in how your force majeure clause takes place. So you do need to keep that in mind. But most importantly, you then need to just read your contract. What do you need to do to rely on this force majeure provision? Invariably, you'll have to give some sort of note Notice. It is remarkable in the 25 or so years of practice that I've had, when people are required to give notice under contracts, whether they be notices of force majeure or frankly notices of anything else, how often those notices are given improperly and invalidly. Most contracts contain notice provisions telling you exactly how to serve a notice. It's amazing how many times people simply don't read that part of the contract. It's normally on the penultimate page. If if you're looking for it. Um, it'll tell you what address to send it to, who to address it to, whether to send it by courier, by fax, by email, etc. Make sure you comply. If it says serve it within 14 days, why serve it on day 15? All that does is it makes people like me money because I get to have an argument with the other side's lawyers about whether it's a valid notice or not. 
it's really not helpful. If you've got to serve it and the contract says serve it within 14 days, serve it within 14 days. Stop having those arguments. You can always serve an updated notice later um, and you may be required on your, your contract to do so. But follow the rules. The rules are there for a reason. They're to make your life easier. They're actually to make your counterpart's life manageable as well. Um, but sometimes it's amazing how often, um, as I say, they are not followed. And then work out what are the consequences of you having served that notice. It's very easy in the current environment to sit there and think, oh, force majeure, must serve a notice. Then I don't have to worry about what my contract says because I, I'm relieved of all duties under it. Well, usually that's wrong. Um, often you'll be relieved of some duties, but certainly not all. Um, my screen seems to have frozen, so I'm, we won't worry about that for the moment. Um, what notice of force majeure have for that will depend on drafting of the clause. Um, many commercial contracts will provide for a whole range of different reliefs and other consequences. Uh, some obligations may be suspended, absolutely. You may get an extension of time for performance of other obligations, um, but not always. Um, in construction contracts, time is often what you do get. Um, but you might be relieved from liability for, for the non-performing party. Uh, if you can't perform, yes, you might get a get out of jail free card. If the force majeure event goes on for some time, um, you may get the right to terminate the contract. That sounds great, but sometimes you might not want to terminate. And if you served a notice of force majeure, it may be that not only do you have the right to terminate, but your counterparty may get the right to terminate after so many months too. So if it's a contract you don't want to be terminated, you may not want to take that risk, and you may take the short-term pain of being in breach rather than relying on the force majeure provisions. Um, sometimes there'll be a very complex allocation of the losses resulting from a suspension or termination. Um, some contracts provide for that in detail, others will say very little and leave it to the parties to either negotiate or the general law to perform. And always you'll have a duty to continue to make efforts to avoid the impacts, impact of whatever event it is um, that has occurred. So that all seems, I hope, relatively straightforward, but there are risks associated with invoking a force majeure clause as well. Um, first of all, as I've said, you need to work out what obligations are affected by the notice. Is it everything or is it just some? But then you need to be really careful because if you improperly allege force majeure, you yourselves can find yourselves in repudiatory breach of contract. That can result in your counterparty terminating your contract and suing you for damages. So you think you're being clever serving a force majeure notice, um, but actually if it's invalid, you could find yourself in a world of pain. Uh, that is surprisingly common an outcome, and I'll talk a little bit more about that just in a moment. But what other obligations do you have? Um, well, you might have lender obligations. If you've got loans from banks and you serve a notice of force majeure, check your loan documentation. You might need to inform your lenders that that's what you've done. And if you don't, you might find yourself in breach of your financial covenants. Now, that may be even more serious than the problem you find yourself in with the force majeure in the first place. Um, if you're a listed company, you might need to make a stock exchange announcement. Um, and finally, and this is often strangely forgotten, many companies spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds every year on insurance premiums. Well, let's have a look at those policies. Have you paid those premiums for a good reason? Uh, could you be making a claim on your insurers? If you can, you can guarantee those insurance policies will have notification requirements and prompt notification requirements that if you miss, your policy will be voided. So we need to make sure that if we're looking to make an insurance claim, we've acted promptly. Um, so that's a very high level overview of the law and some of the complications. 
But far more important, I would suggest to all of us is, what does all of this mean in practice? Oh, my slides have come back to life, that's good. Um, the, well, my expectation is of every 100 force majeure notices that have been served, I expect deals to get done in 95 out of those 100. I don't think the parties in the current environment are gonna to want to be suing each other and spending money on lawyers fighting about whether a force majeure notice was valid or not. Um, so you might conclude from that, well, okay, so let's not bother serve the notice in the first place. That I would suggest is the wrong answer. Until you've engaged in a negotiation, you know a deal has been struck, you need to protect yourself as best you can. That means serving valid force majeure notices. Um, and I stress throughout this that the word valid is really important because of those hundred force majeure notices that have been served, I would be prepared to wager that at least 50% of them are, are probably invalid. Now you might think in the current environment that's ridiculous. Surely more of them are valid than that. As I say, my experience tells me over the years that as many invalid notices will have been served for negotiation purposes, if nothing else, um, as valid ones. Um, sometimes they'll have been served invalidly without the party realizing they are invalid. They'll have just made a mistake uh, or they won't have done the analysis properly. But often they'll be deliberately served invalidly, just in the hope that it enables them to escape their contractual obligations and do a deal in what are for all of us very, very difficult circumstances. So if you are an in-house counsel and you've received a force majeure notice, uh, even if on its face you think, hmm, that sounds reasonable, I would encourage you to dig out the contract, uh, check the force majeure clause, and really ask yourself, is it a valid notice or not? Because if it isn't, it changes the dynamic in any future negotiation you will have. So that said, uh, my top tips before I hand over to Glyn, um, I guess I would say the first one, speak to legal counsel at the outset and formulate a strategy. If you're an expert in force majeure and contractual analysis, you may be able to do all of that yourself. But it's really important that you think about the consequences of the notice you're about to serve before you serve it for all the reasons I've outlined. Always read the contract. Um, it sounds a statement of the blindingly obvious. But all I can say is over 25 years, I've made a huge amount of money out of clients that have failed to read their contracts. Um, follow the contract, I give the right notices, give them when they're told to be given, uh, support them with the evidence that's required. Consider the local law issues we discussed on, provide you're in a common law jurisdiction, not gonna be a big deal. Mitigate your loss, you do that in the ordinary course, just because COVID-19 is a disaster globally, doesn't mean the normal rules don't apply. Absolutely, you should be taking what steps you can to mitigate your loss. Then perhaps not obvious, but follow the news. Um, you might serve a force majeure notice on Monday, and by the following Monday, the world has changed. Maybe you didn't, you, when you analysed your contract, you didn't think you did have grounds to serve it, and a week later you do. Or maybe actually the event of force majeure has stopped. Uh, maybe eventually the MCO will will be lifted and that means the force majeure event that you're relying on no longer exists. You've almost certainly got an obligation to update your counterparty at that point. So you need to be current with what's going on and at the moment that really is a daily occurrence. The world is changing so quickly. Um, you, you need to be up to date. And finally, just keep the evidence that you would normally keep. As I say, I'm not expecting a raft of litigation over force majeure uh, in the coming weeks and months, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. It happens occasionally uh, and even if even if not in your negotiations the more evidence you've got to support the position you were adopting uh, the stronger your bargaining position will likely be uh, as things progress uh, and hopefully to a commercial deal being struck so that's all I wanted to say about force majeure I'm now going to hand over to Glyn who's a corporate partner in my team uh, and he's going to talk to you about the exciting things of how to sign a contract now you'd have thought that was obvious but Glyn's going to confuse Use the hell out of you. Over to Glenn. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, as Peter mentioned, it's not as um, it's not as easy as you may think. Um, although the law the law on this sort of thing is actually very flexible and it's generally 
your friend. Um, it does involve a degree of, of forward planning in, or, in order to make sure that it, that it works. Um, now, as Peter mentioned, we've seen a lot of remote deal doing over the last few months, and we expect that to continue. Um, so we thought we'd kick off with um, just a few questions that you ought to be asking yourself um, and when should you be asking those? Um, and indeed, um, when should you be speaking to your, to your legal counsel about those key questions if you're currently involved in a transaction? Um, so what to ask and when, whether you're involved in a, an M&A transaction, a commercial contract, um, a banking and finance transaction, a construction pro project, um, you should be considering these questions. And regardless of how smoothly your transaction has been running to date, um, um, you should stop and ask these questions and better still stop and discuss these questions with your um, legal counsel and indeed they should be asking you these questions. Um, so just talking to a few of those questions on slide 15, um, the first really is a general question, how in practice will signing be achieved and how in practice will closing of a, of a transaction be achieved? Um, you know, that's a catch-all question and a good one to kick off your discussion with your advisors on. Um, and really the, the point there is to, at, at the start of a transaction or as early as possible in the transaction, think about the end. Um, because whilst you're considering the commercial terms of your deal, um, and you will often, when things are moving quickly, forget how you will um, achieve the practicalities of signing. So it's worth considering that at the, at the very outset. Um, Secondly, what does the law require, which is the, the question on the right there? Um, that is obviously very relevant. And what I mean here is what does the law require by way of formalities for signing, passing of resolutions and the making of filings, some of which may be required for the implementation of your transaction. And we'll, we'll talk to a few of those a little bit later. Another good question to ask generally yourself or your, your managers, your own, your own business, is what do your internal policies require? And the reason for asking that question is quite often, and we've seen this in practice, internal policies will require that something that is more extensive or more onerous than what the law requires, um, i.e. the taking of additional approval steps. Um, you may have a policy that, um, you know, an extra a sort of counter signatory is, is required for a particular type of document. Some of those things may or may not be required by the law, but it's worth asking yourself um, what your policies require in terms, of, in terms of steps to be taken upon signing or closing. Um, the remainder of the points on that slide are mainly practicalities, but nonetheless important um, and frequently forgotten about. Who will be where and when? And more importantly, do they have access to the technology that you'll need in order for them to be involved in the signing or closing of your, your transaction or your contract? Um, if they have a printer and a scanner, generally that will be sufficient. Um, as I'll come on to in the moment, the law on signatures and the conduct of meetings or the passing of resolutions is actually very flexible. Um, so provided they have those things, generally you'll be able to get by. Um, also worth asking yourself, and this is not a legal question, but more a practical tip, what technology is at your disposal? And indeed, should you be considering um, upgrading, adapting that technology to see yourself through the following months? Um, because as Peter said, um, even once the sort of present crisis abates slightly, um, you know, our prediction is that the world in terms of the way it will conduct business <clears throat> will change somewhat and therefore the need for technology and systems to be able to do business will, will remain. Also we're thinking about things that are outside your control. Um, you will not be able to control everything in your transaction or your, your commercial contract. So you know, be aware that your, your counterparty um, may not be as well organized, may not have the same technology, and indeed may not be as well advised as you are. Um, so it is worth talking to them. Um, generally, remote signing, remote closing of transactions requires both parties to, to make a plan and collaborate. Um, so it's worth having that conversation as soon as you possibly can. Other things that may be outside of your own control as you're concluding a deal would be the availability of certain reports from online providers, um, the ability 
opportunity to make certain filings which may or may not be required for your transaction and the location of originals most of us have left the office and our printed documents are are sitting in our drawers in the office um, so those will all be challenges that you may face and will largely be outside your control um, we'll, we'll touch on some of those through some practical examples towards the end of this, um, this session. Other forward planning that you may wish to consider. You may look to amend those, those internal policies <clears throat> that I referred to earlier, possibly temporarily um, for the duration of the, um, the current crisis. Uh, as I said, your, your policies may require things that are in excess of what the law requires in order to conclude a valid contract or to hold a valid board meeting. Um, so you may want to consider sort of waiving or relaxing those temporarily in order to, to allow business to function as close to possible as usual um, in the current circumstances. Secondly, uh, and this is certainly more on the, on the legal side in terms of steps to be taken, consider amending your constitutions. Um, so the constitution of a company, um, your memorandum, and your articles um, or your other constitution, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, um, that will often um, set out and regulate what you can do by way of um, virtual board meetings, um, using written resolutions for board meetings or shareholder resolutions in place of, um, in place of actual meetings. Um, now that's not always straightforward to implement in the current environment because the taking of those steps and the amending of constitutions will often involve um, passing a resolution itself in order to achieve that. But I guess the point there is consider, consider those things in advance because you may have some time now to consider amending the constitutions for your companies. But when you're in the cut and thrust of a transaction or in the final stages of negotiating a contract and approaching signing or closing, you may be under more pressure, so do look at those things now. Thirdly, consider powers of attorney, alternates and proxies. If you've asked yourself those practical steps that I mentioned earlier <clears throat> as to where people will be located and what technology they'll have access to, um, you may find that some people are simply unavailable. Um, possibly they've, been, they've become stuck overseas, they're with family members and um, you know, they, don't, they don't have access to their their home office if they're lucky enough to have one at home um, they may simply be unavailable um, and in those cases you may want to consider using things like powers of attorney um, the appointment of alternate directors or proxies for shareholder meetings essentially to allow another individual to perform the role of the individual that's unavailable um, as part of completion or, or signing of your transaction um, as i mentioned earlier in terms of um, electronic and digital technology um, it's not too late to upgrade and indeed a number of systems that will enable you to implement things like electronic signatures and hold virtual board meetings are freely available. Um, some businesses will obviously have very good technology um, dealing with these things. Um, some will have upgraded um, as this crisis um, commenced. Um, and we'll be, we've been helping some clients procure um, additional technology to, to, to ease the burden. But by and large, you know, these things are not expensive and they're not, um, they're often freely available. Um, so do think about upgrading um, if, you're, if you're currently anticipating undertaking a remote transaction. And as I mentioned earlier, to talk to your kind of party because it generally takes two to time go in order to complete a transaction um, remotely. So moving on to a, a little bit of law, uh, I'm conscious you, you, you want to all be lawyers, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't dwell on this too much. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Malaysia, um, um, and we'll talk a little bit about England by way of a comparison. Now, Malaysia, like most jurisdictions, has a regime that distinguishes between electronic signatures on one hand and digital signatures on the other. Um, and the definitions in the applicable Malaysian legislation are, are here. Um, now, for the uninitiated, really the point to remember uh, and this is the case across most jurisdictions, is that um, electronic signatures and digital signatures are not the same thing. Usually digital signatures are a subset of electronic signatures. Now, an electronic signature is uh, a symbol attached to a contract, and that can take various forms, and we'll come on to some of those forms in a moment. Um, the, different, the key difference from a digital signature is that an electronic signature is 
generally doesn't require any form of or involve any form of authentication. Whereas a digital, digital signature generally involves some form of authentication that involves a, um, a system beyond a mere electronic signing um, using a stylus that will um, guarantee to the recipient the authentic nature of the signature that they've received electronically. Um, and as I mentioned, that, that generally involves some form of um, third party technology beyond um, beyond what would typically be available in, in things like Microsoft Office. Now in England, um, again, very similar, um, and again, a very flexible and friendly um, regime. Um, we've listed here on slide 19, a list of the, the acts or the steps that would constitute and qualify as, as an electronic signature under English law. Um, just to discuss a few of those, um, the most commonly used method and the one that I would tend to use is to electronically paste a copy of your signature into an electronic version of a contract. Um, you can do that in things like Adobe, fairly straightforward. I'm, I'm sure a number of you would be, would be familiar with that. Um, it, is, it is, as I say, a very flexible regime. So clicking I accept on a website can of itself constitute a digital signature, uh, sorry, an electronic signature. Um, even if it doesn't involve um, using your signature as you would understand it, um, that, that can qualify as an electronic signature and be used to, to sign a contract in a binding fashion. The last one I'll touch on is typing your name into an email, which I think is, is I think both a blessing and something to be wary of. Um, uh, the regime in, in England, the law in England is, is very flexible, as I said, and this is the case in a number of jurisdictions. So merely typing your name into an email which contains the terms of a contract that may be sufficient to constitute um, an electronic signature. Um, so do, do be aware of that because you may be caught out by, by signing a contract when you don't intend to do it, but it's also, as I, as I mentioned, a very, um, a very flexible and positive thing in the current environment where it is, it is easy to sign and, and conclude contracts over, over email. Um, so just moving on to when um, a document can be validly executed using an electronic signature. Um, the, the Malaysian legislation on this is um, fairly straightforward. You can use an electronic signature <clears throat> of the sort that I've described, i.e. fixing a symbol or a scanned version of your signature to, to an electronic contract, provided it is a commercial transaction. Um, the definition of commercial transaction is very broad. I think the key point to note is that it will cover most um, contracts and, and transactions that you would be concluding in a business context. So that's not usually the difficult hurdle to, to overcome. Um, secondly, in terms of, of tests for the applicability of the electronic signatures legislation, the, the document that you're dealing with um, needs to be outside of a list of excluded documents that are prescribed in the legislation. Um, it's a relatively short list and doesn't really undermine the flexibility and, and, and helpful nature of this legislation. Excluded documents include things like powers of attorney and the creation of trusts. Um, so do always check that, that list to ensure that you're not dealing with one of the excluded documents. Um, and provided that is the case, i.e. it's a commercial transaction and you're not on the excluded list, then the electronic signatures legislation will be applicable and, and available to be used. Turning to England, um, Again, a very flexible and virtual friendly regime, if I can put it that way. Um, simple contracts, i.e. things other than deeds, in, in England don't need to be in any particular form at all. Um, that has always been the case. Therefore, using an electronic signature on an electronic version of a document um, would clearly be sufficient to conclude um, an ordinary contract. <clears throat> the thing to be aware of, uh, as you've seen in, in, in bold text there, we said always seek legal advice is that there are specific requirements applicable to certain documents. Um, so always think about the nature of the document that you're seeking to execute and consider whether there are any specific requirements attaching to those documents. Um, things to watch out for include sale of land, guarantees, um, and other specific types of contracts. 
Under English law, in some cases, there are requirements for contracts to be in writing and requirements for them to be signed. Um, and of course, you, know, you and I would typically understand signing to involve um, the usage of a pen. Um, helpful to note that if a contract is on screen, whether that's your smartphone or your, or your desktop, um, that will be sufficient for it to be considered to be in writing, where that is a requirement under law. Um, as I mentioned earlier, email exchanges and website trading or website contracts are also generally considered to be in writing would satisfy that requirement. Um, where it's required to be signed, as I mentioned, electronic signatures will generally satisfy that requirement. And as I mentioned earlier, be wary, typing your name into an email may of itself constitute signing a contract. What about deeds? Now, deeds are more complex. Um, and we could spend around 30 minutes talking about the, the requirements and the tips and traps related to the execution of deeds. Um, those tips and traps quite often apply in a, in, a, in a physical signing as well as a virtual signing. Um, but all I'll say for the moment is please speak to a lawyer if you know that you will be executing a deed. Um, there, are, there are ways to use electronic signatures for the execution of deeds, but there are certain requirements which need to be borne in mind and may take a little bit of extra advanced planning. So other tips and traps on um, remote signing, I'll just talk about a couple of these. Firstly, um, think about what registries may require and talk to your legal counsel about what registries may require. <clears throat> what I mean there is that the law may allow a particular contract to be concluded electronically or using an electronic signature. But certain companies' registries around the world, certain land registries around the world, which may be in places where you're not concluding the relevant contract, in order for the document to be filed, may require things like wet ink signatures. So the registry will, will require a physical copy of the, the wet ink um, signature to be delivered for, for filing purposes. Um, now, clearly, where you've concluded something, concluded a contract electronically, you may be able to print the electronically signed version of that contract, um, but unless, unless that is in wet ink, um, which it wouldn't be if you've concluded it electronically, that may not be satisfactory to certain registries. So that's one thing to watch out for. Um, secondly, witnessing is, is a tricky one and the rules differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In some cases, in order to achieve valid execution, the signature may need to be witnessed. Um, so the question, and this is a question we've been asked frequently over recent weeks, is whether um, a virtual witnessing is possible. So if you can see the document that I'm holding in front of me, and you can see me signing it, can you then, um, can you, does that constitute the witnessing of my signature, and can you sign as a witness for that, for that signature? Um, that does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In fact, um, the UK government is, is looking at that and considering legislating to clarify um, in jurisdictions such as Australia, that is generally not possible. Um, so don't, don't assume that witnessing by, by Zoom or Skype or whatever else will be, will be sufficient. Um, lastly, um, sworn statements in front of commissioners um, for oaths. As things stand in most jurisdictions, generally there's no way around that at the moment. Um, if there is a need for a sworn statement, um, it may simply be impossible to achieve that um, whilst um, restrictions against uh, uh, meeting in person are in place. So if, if you think that is going to be needed in connection with your contracts or your transactions, um, think about it in advance. Um, there may be ways to, to make plans that are compliant with um, movement restrictions that will nonetheless give you access to a, um, a solicitor or a commissioner for all this. Um, Changing tax slightly, another component to undertaking transactions and doing deals remotely would be passing, re um, passing resolutions. <clears throat> um, what you can do by way of passing resolutions, either by way of virtual meetings or passing the resolutions in writing, is largely a function of the constitutions of companies. Um, and we set out, set out some examples here relating to England and, and Malaysia. Um, now, clearly, this, the aim of this is to avoid the need to have a physical meeting 
where in the case of board meetings, directors typically gather physically in, in a room. Um, I'll talk a little bit about virtual meetings first. You know, they have been increasingly common outside of the current environment. Um, you know, directors are often in different places. They're not always in the jurisdiction, um, sort of home jurisdiction for the company. Um, so virtual meetings are increasingly prevalent. Um, most newer articles of association, part of the constitutional documents for, for an English company, um, allow for virtual meetings. Um, and there's a model form of articles which are, which are used in the UK and they do provide for, for virtual meetings. Um, Table A, which is the older version of the mod model articles in the UK, which, is, um, which has still been adopted and is in place for certain companies, does not allow for that. So it is important to check the, the constitutional documents to, to, to ensure you're permitted to have a virtual board meeting. Um, Malaysia is generally possible unless there's a prohibition against having virtual meetings in the in the constitution. Written resolutions are the other, other way to achieve um, the passing of board resolutions. Um, again, England and in Malaysia and Malaysia are on a similar footing in this sense. It's commonly provided for in the articles, table A being the old form of English articles to allow for this. The new model articles also allow for this. Um, in Malaysia, it's also very commonly provided for in the constitution. So, I think the takeaway there is if your transaction requires the passing of a board resolution um, simply because you can't get together personally doesn't mean you can't go ahead and pass that resolution by, by one means or another. So a couple of our recent experiences I'll just touch on for, for, a, few, for a few minutes. Um, some of these have been flagged in the slides already. Um, we've seen practical examples of these arising in the last week or two weeks. Firstly, unavailability of company searches. Um, certain company registries around the world have either limited functionality or in some cases, no functionality. Um, all I can suggest is, is in those circumstances, ask yourself where else might you be able to obtain the information from? Can you get it from your counterparty? You know, can you get a copy of the, the accounts you're looking for or the register of directors you're looking for? Can you get that from your, from your counterparty? Um, and ask them to warrant it as being accurate. Um, that may be a, um, a useful substitute. We had a situation recently, this, this is the second example, where um, the timeline for filing a reduction of capital in the UK um, was extended quite significantly. Um, reductions of capital can be used to create additional distributable reserves in companies in order to make a, um, a distribution um, from those reserves to, to shareholders. Um, Previously, that was able to be undertaken on a same day basis in the UK. Um, so if you're undertaking a transaction that involved a reduction of capital, you could do it on the day of closing. Um, that was extended to around seven days in the UK. Um, no real neat solution to that one other than to attend to that in advance of your closing date. So in that case, we, um, we decided to take that particular step several days in advance. Um, and that may be the case for certain other matters. Um, if you have a deadline for reaching a deal, um, for example, under a third party contract, you may be required to sign something um, with, a, with a counterparty within a certain period. And you may have your, you know, your fully formed set of documents involving deeds and, um, and all sorts of resolutions um, and documents which, be, need to be uh, which need to be signed by multiple people in multiple places. Um, I think the practical advice in that circumstance is what, need, what really needs to be achieved in order to comply with the requirement that you're subject to. If the requirement is to conclude a contract with someone, well, can you conclude the contract orally? Possibly. Can you conclude it over email? Possibly. Um, so step back and look at what is, the, what is the minimum that you may need to do in order to, to comply with that requirement to conclude a contract. Um, lastly, certified copy is quite an interesting one, and I was asked this question. Um, what happens if you need to, to, to give a certified copy of something uh, and the original is in your office and you're at home? Um, and I think that's a, that's a, a difficult one, and, and I think the answer is that it needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. I think theoretically, if the original is in the locked drawer of your office, no one else has access to it, and you have a copy of that document at home, 
um, then I think it's arguable that you would be able to certify that as a true copy because you know that it is a true copy. Um, the original is still under your control, albeit that you don't have, it, have uh, access to it at that time. But you do have a copy that you have taken in advance and you know that that is a true copy. Um, so you may wish to consider whether that is, is possible and appropriate in the circumstances. Lastly, remote deal doing tips. I, I won't dwell on these for, for too long, most of which we've covered. The first one is, please look at slide 15, ask questions and ask them now, even if your deal is presently running smoothly. That may not be the case when you get to the pointy end. Um, plan ahead, um, really the same point. That is always a top tip and something that we remind our clients and ourselves of, but it's particularly important at the moment because as I said, there may be certain things that you need to do in advance. Um, or to make additional preparations given the, given the limitations that a number of us are subject to at the moment. Identify what is within and outside your control um, and, and act on those points now and discuss where relevant with counterparties, regulators, um, um, regulators who need to receive filings, can they waive the requirement for wetting in the short term? Do things earlier than you need to. Um, leaving things to the last minute is never a good idea. It's particularly a bad idea at the moment. Be reasonable. Um, this is a little bit of uh, sort of general sort of humanity and, um, and good business contact, um, conduct. Um, if, if your counterparty cannot comply with the strict requirements because of restrictions they're subject to, whether in Malaysia or elsewhere, um, I think I'd urge you to consider, um, assuming it's a, you know, a good commercial relationship and you're not in a dispute, be reasonable, try and help them out because you may be the one who needs help in a week or two's time. Um, and lastly, relax and seek legal advice. Um, you're probably not in uncharted territory um, and we've probably seen the particular difficulty that you're encountering in the past and there's usually um, a way through it. So I hope that provides you with some comfort to, to finish off. Lastly, questions. I'm not sure whether we've received thank any. You. All right, thank you very much, Glenn. And of course, Peter, who spoke earlier, very insightful indeed, and many take home messages. Uh, I've learned a thing or two today. Uh, I'm not an expert in contractual obligations, but yeah, uh, learned something today. So it's now a time for QA. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is What other instances or situation has force majeure been used and produced success? Uh, mind, if, uh, mind sharing past experience, if any. And another one, um, what if there is no force major uh, clause uh, in a contract between employer and employee? Can employers still terminate employment contracts due to this pandemic? Okay, um, two quite different questions. First, the first, taking them in that order, um, there are, uh, I didn't wish to give the impression that force majeure notices are served willy-nilly and they're never useful. They, there are many, many examples where force majeure notices are effective and they do do what the contract says, namely relieve parties from their obligations. Uh, I mean, the, the perhaps the easiest example is if you are a manufacturing company and your factory has been closed down by the MCO you know, because you're not an essential business, uh, almost certainly you will have a valid claim for force majeure in relation to any uh, deadlines that you've got coming up for delivery of the goods that you're manufacturing. Uh, those things, sorts of things are straightforward. Similarly, if you're a construction contractor and you've been banned from putting your people on site, uh, then you'll almost certainly be uh, entitled to an extension of time um, for, the, for the period that you're banned from um, doing the work that you were supposed to be doing on site. So in, in every sector and in every industry, there, there are examples of uh, where force majeure is valid, um, for sure. Um, as I say, there are many examples too of people trying it on. Uh, and that's, I guess, our role to, to see the distinction between the two. But, but force majeure is a very important uh, contractual mechanism, uh, which is used frequently um, and is very effective when used properly. Um, so that's the first one. So far as the second one is concerned, I mean, I don't think you would, you would not normally be relying on force majeure in an employment context. Uh, your employment contract would normally be governed by mandatory laws in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Um, and it will also, whether you can terminate somebody will, is far less likely to come down to the terms of the contract. I don't think many employment contracts will have provisions in um, dealing with COVID scenarios unless they were very short term 
employment contracts, but your average employment contract will come down to the, the, the laws of the country in which you're an employee. Um, often the sort of redundancy laws at the end of the day. Uh, terminating people is normally challenging in many jurisdictions. Uh, Malaysia is no different. Um, it's, this legislation is often stacked in favour of the employee. Um, so you can terminate people for cause, but what cause? Um, how, how, hard, how high is the bar in, in those circumstances? Usually very high. Uh, redundancy, similarly, um, that varies dramatically from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Japan and making somebody redundant in Japan is, if you look at the law, it says it's possible. But the first test is you have to show it's, it's necessary. And necessity requires you to show that all but that if you don't make that person redundant, your company will be bankrupt. Uh, that's a pretty high bar to say the very least. So de facto, there is no redundancy. You end up having to do deals with people and negotiate uh, voluntary exits. The position at the other end of the spectrum, you've got Hong Kong, where it's relatively easy just to give somebody their contractual notice period. There is some statutory severance payable, but it's relatively low. Uh, and it's accordance with a formula. And then you, the rest of Asia is somewhere along the spectrum in between. Um, so whether you can terminate somebody in Malaysia because of COVID um, will depend upon an analysis of the redundancy laws in this country. Uh, I'm not a Malaysian lawyer, so I'm not going to overstep my mark and, uh, and tell you what the answer is. I've got a pretty good idea what I think the answer is, uh, but I'll leave that to the experts. Thanks, Azra. All right. So uh, thank you very much, Peter, on that explanation. We have three more minutes, but I believe uh, we can at least answer one more question. So sure. this one uh, is, please, if we, I can check if we, are, if we are allowed to terminate contracts during MCO for services such as cleaning, pest control, waste collection, air conditioning, maintenance uh, under a school. So that is the question. Uh Again, that one I, I think would, that, that may well depend upon the nature of the services contract you've got. But the people that are doing those sorts of roles tend not to be employees, in my experience. So they tend to be sort of independent contractors who are employed by a company that specialises in cleaning services and then a, a, an organisation will have a contract with that cleaning service. Whether you can terminate those types of contracts will depend upon the terms of the contract. Um, the answer is maybe uh, without seeing the contracts i'm afraid i can't i can't tell they could they could be very different all right thank you again so before i conclude our session may i request each speaker uh, to give any any concluding remarks for our audience perhaps peter first sure i think i would just start uh, end where i started which is just encourage you all to remain optimistic and, but realistic um, try not to spiral into the abyss of despair, which is a very easy thing to do. Um, as a global law firm, we see things around the world, and it's very clear to me that Asia and Australia are currently faring a lot better than Europe uh, and the US, which are in a, a world more pain. So if we think we've got things bad, it's not as bad as it could be. Um, so there's reason for some optimism, um, but it's a tough time for us all. And I just encourage everybody on the call to support each other. I think it's uh, the one thing that's become very clear to me over the last what, six weeks we've now been in lockdown is people are craving human interaction. It can, if you're living at home and you're locked down on your own, it's a pretty lonely place. So pick up the phone to your mates and make sure they hear some human voices. I think that's the best thing we can do for each other. That is right. What about you, Glyn? Um, I think I'd just say that in many places, business is still being conducted. Um, and, and, and transactions, contracts are still being concluded. Um, I think in many places, people are starting to look to how do we return to business as usual um, and making preparations for that. Um, we continue to sign, we continue to close transactions. As, as I mentioned, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, people need to plan in advance, but it's all, it's all possible. So I, I, I think quite often, as, as Peter said, it's. Um, in many places, um, the, the picture is not quite as bad as um, the, the press or others may have you believe. All right, thank you again to both Peter and Glenn for sharing their valuable thoughts uh, and advice to our viewers today. Uh, special thanks to, of course, our dear viewers who've been listening since the first minute of this session. Thank you again for all the excellent support. We shall meet again in our next interesting series of webinar with us at the MCC.
that concludes our session. From me, Hazri Musa, stay safe. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.